Welcome to our Bio 3-4 ATI Notes Revision Lecture um, for April. My name is Angelica and I'll be your Bio Tutor for today. Um, so yeah, welcome to ATI Notes. What are we? We are, uh, well ATI Notes is an organisation that was founded in 2007, kind of aimed at evening out the VC playing field. And kind of making sure that students have access to tons of free resources that will help them to excel in their, their high school studies. So it's a completely free website. I'd highly recommend registering for it. Um, it's completely free, you can be completely anonymous, and I love the website. So we have tons of free resources, as I mentioned. So we have study notes and articles, which past students who've scored really highly at their subjects have written. Um, they give good guides as to how to score well on a subject, or how to um, do well on your stacks and exams and things, or exam tips and strategies. Really useful. I'd recommend checking them out. We have lectures like these ones. Please be sure to check out the rest of the lectures we've got going on this week. And next week too, I think. So, yeah, um, check out any of the other subjects you're doing. Also, they're completely free. You can access them online. Super convenient, and we'll jump on and answer questions as well. So, yeah, bring your questions to the lectures. My favorite part of the ATI Notes forums or the website was this discussion forum. So it's an online Q and A where you can ask questions relating to any of your subjects. Really, there were also lots of like social type forums as well. But my favorite was the bio forum. And so when I was in year 11 doing year 12 bio, I would spam that forum constantly with like a million questions. And past students who scored really well would get back to me and answer. So it was super useful, super convenient. Um, it's a lot better than spamming a teacher at like 11pm on a random Tuesday night. So I recommend the forums. We also have really good videos which kind of make the content a lot more digestible and easy to understand. So I'd recommend checking those out also. Uh, we've got newsletters and an ATAR calculator, which I probably spent way too much time on in high school, but I think it's kind of fun to see how you stack up and to see like what kind of study scores can affect your ATAR. So I think that's kind of fun and heaps more. So definitely check out the website. It's completely free. As I mentioned, you can be anonymous, make up a fake name. No one needs to know it's you. Um, but yeah, if there's one thing you take away from this, I recommend making an account and going to the discussion space. And just asking any kind of questions you have there. We've got a few more resources which we'll discuss later. Um, these include Tute Smart, Study Guides, and Add Unlimited. Special thank you to Latrobe Uni, RMIT Uni, Deakin, UTS, and Macquarie Uni. Um, just like a thank you to our sponsors. And yeah, just have a bit of water before I get started. I'm currently recovering a bit um, from being sick, so I'm not as peppy today, sadly, as I'd like to be, because I'm generally kind of a huge nerd for bio, and I'll be, like, obsessed with the topics we're talking about, but right now I'm a bit flat, so I'm really sorry. Hopefully that didn't carry too much. So, just a bit about me. I think I mentioned, I hope I mentioned, my name is Angelica. Uh, I graduated in 2019 with a 97.25 ATAR, 49 bio study score, 40 for PA and 47 for English. I completed biomedical science at Monash, so that was a three-year degree, so I just completed that last year, and now I'm doing med at Monash, so I'm doing my first year post-grad med. Um, I tutor bio, PE, and English, and I've got two cats, so this is Ollie and this is Marble, and they're really naughty and they get up to lots of trouble, but I adore them anyways. I'm always so paranoid it stopped recording, so I'm probably going to keep checking that back and forth. Hopefully it's fine. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed the lecture today. If you've got any questions, just pop them in the chat and I'll get back to you. And yeah. So what are we covering today? We're looking at gene expression and regulation, cellular respiration, photosynthesis, DNA manipulation, and questions and study tips and advice. So we're gonna go through all this content. I've set a timer up, so um, when that's done, we will end, I guess. But yeah, we'll get through as much of this content as we can. And then I will probably spend some time discussing study tips and techniques. And yeah, if you've got any questions, put them in the chat and I will hopefully get back to you. So we've got lots of definitions in these slides. Anything in purple or bolded is probably a really good definition that you want to remember. So do keep them in mind. Um, make flashcards out of them, I recommend. So I, I use Anki in uni, but in high school I'd use uh, like Quizlet or I'd like make a physical flashcard. So you can make like actual flashcards and print them out and use them. And that may be a really useful way of studying. So, what is gene expression? A gene is a particular sequence of DNA bases which encodes for a specific polypeptide chain. So these are inherited from a parent to an offspring and they're uh, kept within particular loci or locuses. 
loci is the actual plural form of that word. And so what a locus is, is a fixed position in the chromosome where a specific gene is located. What is gene expression itself? So this is the transcription and translation of a gene. And so this is the process by which genetic material such as DNA is converted into a functional 3D protein. <clears throat> so it goes from DNA to RNA or mRNA, and this mRNA will then be translated into a polypeptide, and hopefully a functional protein. So there are many different stages of gene expression. So the first one is transcription, which occurs in the nucleus. So you have a pre-mRNA strand being formed from DNA. In stage two, the pre-mRNA must undergo post-transcriptional modifications in the nucleus in order to become mature mRNA. The third step entails the mRNA moving to a ribosome. This can either be a free ribosome in the cytosol or it can be attached to the rough ER. After this, the mRNA will be translated at the ribosome into a polypeptide chain. And then finally, that polypeptide chain will be modified, transported, and secreted or used within the cell. Cool, so this process here is just showing uh, transcription. So you can see the DNA here is double-stranded, we've got 5.3 prime end, we've got the coding strand and the template strand, and you've got the RNA polymerase, which kind of opens up, so it unwinds that DNA and opens it up um, to access it, and this allows the making of an mRNA strand. And you can see that's being made here. You can see that in DNA, we've got four different nucleotide bases, A, G, C, and T, and in RNA, we've got A, G, C, and U. So these four bases are going to be used to create um, the messenger RNA. So I kind of tried to summarize the content as much as I can. I know it's a pretty intensive topic and it can be quite difficult to get your head around it. So I'd recommend trying to work through this slowly in your own time as well. Um, it also depends on your way of studying. I personally prefer to read textbooks or like thick slabs of paragraphs, whereas some people might prefer videos. So really figure out what works best for you. And if you are more of a video person, maybe take the time to look up on YouTube transcription simplified or something like that. So <clears throat> what is transcription? This is the process of producing mRNA from a DNA template. <clears throat> okay, let me have some water first. Um, so the process occurs in the nucleus. What happens is that this enzyme called RNA polymerase binds to the promoter region of the gene to be transcribed in the template strand of DNA. Um, you get lots of different uh, enzymes in bio, and it's kind of hard to remember their names sometimes. But if you kind of break down the names, it kind of makes it a bit easier, I think. So RNA polymerase, well, enzymes typically end in A. So anything ending in A, you can kind of guess, is going to be an enzyme. So polymerase enzyme. What is a polymer? So I find it really useful to look up the etymology of words in bio. So if you look at polymer, polymer means a long chain. And so, so far we've got polymerase, an enzyme which makes a long chain. And at the start you've got RNA. So you can kind of presume that this enzyme is going to be something which makes a long chain of RNA, which is exactly what RNA polymerase does. It makes a long strand of RNA, mRNA. So what happens is that this enzyme will bind to this particular region of the gene known as the promoter region, and it will bind um, on the template strand of DNA. Um, the RNA polymerase molecule will then unwind the DNA and then it moves across the template strand and reads it in a 3' prime to 5' prime direction while synthesizing RNA by joining ribonucleotides in the opposite direction, so the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. It says you remember that strands are anti-parallel. What that means is that if you've got 5' prime to 3' prime this way, 5' prime, 3' prime, the opposite strand will have the opposite, so it'll be 5' prime to 3' prime that way. Okay, so it's kind of opposite direction and that's what they mean by anti-parallel. So once that RNA polymerase reaches the end of the gene or the termination sequence, the pre-mRNA molecule will be released. The pre-mRNA strand is complementary to the template strand and has the same sequence as the coding strand, except that T is replaced with U. Uh, this is kind of an intense looking diagram, but it really just does explain what we've just gone over. So we've got three stages here. You don't need to know their names in VCE, but do recognize what occurs. So you can see here the red but um, in the nucleus, RNA polymerase recognizes the recognition sites, causing it to bind to the promoter, which is the side of the gene. The RNA polymerase then separates the DNA into single strands. The template strand can be read in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction. The pre-mRNA nucleotides are quickly paired with their complementary bases, which correspond with the template strand of DNA. Um, the pre-mRNA moves in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, while the template strand of DNA oppositely, uh, moves oppositely from the 3' prime to 5' prime direction. Honestly, I think this diagram 
just kind of is quite technical. Um, it pretty much says exactly what we just discussed, but I think it's a lot more digestible in these little dot points. So I recommend going back and reading these ones. <clears throat> okay, next up we've got RNA processing. And so eukaryotic cells will have three types of post-transcriptional modifications within the nucleus. Um, keep in mind that this is in eukaryotic cells, not prokaryotic cells. So in eukaryotes, we've got introns being removed and axons being spliced or joined together. What are introns? I think of them as interrupting regions of a gene. So they are non-coding regions, um, whereas axons are coding regions. And remember that axons are expressed. So axons express, introns interrupting. This means that mature mRNA is shorter than pre-mRNA um, because the introns will be sliced out. And I think I've got a diagram on the next slide here. I'll show you this. You've also got a methylguanosine cap being added to the 5' end of the RNA molecule and a poly-A tail being added to the 3' end of the RNA molecule. And once these modifications have taken place, the RNA molecule will become mature mRNA and it will leave the nucleus to move to the ribosome. So you can see here we've got that pre-mRNA, we'll have the introns being spliced out and the axons, which are expressed, joined together. We've got the addition of a 5' cap. Um, methylguanosine cap and a poly A tail, which pretty much just means a long chain of A's added to the end of that. And these kind of assist in export from the nucleus. Same diagram once again, um, just kind of showing it a different visual. So why do we remove introns? So it's really important that we remove introns because these regions do not code for protein molecules and they will be useless in translation. Um, we, we do use these regions in some uh, genome modification things, processes, but we don't really discuss this in VCE. So don't worry too much about it, unless you want to. So one gene may be able to code for more than one protein or variation of a protein, depending on which exons are kept in or left out, and you'll have alternate exon splicing. So you can actually shuffle about these genes. Um, you'll look at that if you do biomed in uni. I really enjoyed that and I thought it was super interesting. So yeah, we don't really look at that too much in VCA, in VCE. Uh, this may also help explain why the amount of proteins in the body are so diverse about, despite the amount of DNA present. So we've got the same DNA in all of our cells, but different cells will express different proteins. So our skin cells will express particular proteins needed in the skin, whereas our like, liver cells will express different proteins, our um, the kidney cells will express different proteins, they all express different proteins. And that's because they kind of shuffle about the axons and um, with alternate splicing. So what is the point of that 5' methylguanosine cap? It's really important because it helps to initiate the process of translation, which is recognition at the ribosome. Both the 5' cap and the 3' poly A tail protect the RNA strand from damage from enzymes, and they also add stability. The 3' poly A tail also assists in the export from the nucleus. So that mRNA is going to leave the nucleus via a nuclear pore, and it's going to go off and travel to the ribosome and protein synthesis. So this is the third part, translation. So translation is the synthesis of a protein, and it's the process by which a polypeptide molecule is produced from mRNA at a ribosome. So what happens? Once it leaves the nucleus, the mRNA strand will migrate to a ribosome. It will enter the ribosome at the 5' end, and the start codon AUG is going to instruct the translation to begin, directing for the amino acid methionine to start the polypeptide chain. Each successive codon in the mRNA will pair up with the anticodon of a tRNA molecule carrying a specific amino acid within the ribosome. The process continues with more codons and anticodons pairing, resulting in amino acids being carried by the tRNA molecules, being added to the growing polypeptide chain via peptide bonding or condensation polymerization. And once they stop codon, so UAA, UAG, or UGA, which don't code for amino acids, are reached, translation will cease and the polypeptide chain will be released. I just realized this just says like one, one, one. Sorry about that. Um, these are all progressive steps. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> so here we've got gene expression occurring. We've got the ribosome reading the mRNA, and we've got our um, tRNAs bringing with them amino acids in order to facilitate that process within that polypeptide chain. Cool. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, Okay, turns to gene structure, there are a few more words to know here. So I did mention before, introns and non-coding sections of a gene, or so-called interrupting regions. Exons are sections of a gene that form mRNA and code for proteins, or they are the expressed regions. And you've got the promoter region, which is a section of gene which RNA polymerase can bind to. Operator regions are found in prokaryotic operons, which we'll look at in a few slides, but these are not in eukaryotic genes. 
So how can different cells produce different proteins even though every cell contains the same genome? Well, pretty much cells can switch genes on and off, and this is called upregulating or downregulating. And so they can up or downregulate particular proteins based on the specific needs of a cell. So you can see here, um, in this muscle cell, we, we definitely need muscle protein. And so we might actually express gene A, which might be really important in the muscle cell. Uh, we don't need gene B, perhaps, and so we can downregulate it. And we can upregulate gene C just a little bit. And this may be exactly what we need for the muscle cell. But you can see that the needs differentiate in the skin cell, and that we actually don't need so much expression of gene A in the skin cell. We do need quite a bit of B. So we'll upregulate B, downregulate A, and probably downregulate C as well. Um, and then for the third one, you can see that you definitely downregulate gene B for the nerve cell. So really just kind of switching these genes on and off as needed in order to facilitate and kind of ensure that you're looking at the particular needs of a cell. <clears throat> so how are genes turned on and off? So we've got lots of different transcription factors. And what these are are binding proteins, the DNA binding proteins, which bind specific sequences of DNA at the promoter region and uh, at other regions as well, and they regulate gene expression, and they can either increase or decrease transcription of a gene. So things called repressors, these are transcription factors, and they prevent transcription by binding to the promoter region or the operator region of DNA, thereby preventing RNA polymerase from binding and transcribing the DNA. Um, so you can see we've got activators binding to enhancer regions, and this leads to um, <clears throat> high levels of transcription. You may have repressors binding to operator regions, and this may suppress transcription and actually prevent transcription from occurring, thus downregulating a particular gene. <clears throat> so how are genes turned on or off? You've got a few other genes. You've got regulatory genes. These genes encode for the production of proteins, such as transcription factors, that regulate gene expression. And you've also got structural genes. And so these are genes that produce a protein or product that forms part of the structure or the functioning of an organism. Essentially, every gene except regulatory genes. Um, we've got signaling molecules. So signaling molecules such as hormones can bind to receptors on or within a cell, and they can influence gene expression in that particular cell. So a lot of um, signaling molecules such as hormones are actually proteins, and so they can activate transcription factors that assist in RNA polymerase binding, they can inactivate transcription factors that prevent RNA polymerase binding, can inhibit or switch off particular genes, and also bind DNA directly, and this can alter gene expression also. I'm like dehydrated. I need to get more water. <clears throat> so gene expression is influenced by cell type, stage of development, and the external and internal environments of a cell. Okay, so different cells can actually produce different protein products despite containing the same DNA, and so genes are only expressed when the products needed. Why we do this is to save energy and resources. There's no point like expressing a particular gene and making proteins for something that is not required. Like if you're a skin cell and you're making liver proteins, you don't need liver proteins then. There is no point. So you want to save energy and resources by just turning that off and not need like to use it. Uh, we can produce excess proteins or proteins when they're not needed. That when proteins are not are not needed by a cell, and we're producing them, this can actually harm the organism. Um, it can interfere with the normal functioning of the cell and kind of disturb it. Um, some genes are only required to be expressed at certain points in the lifespan, such as in embryonic development. So we've got these things called like Hox genes, and they can help in like digit formation. These are not really needed to be expressed later on in life, or it really depends on the needs of a person or individual or a cell type, but a lot of them are not required after you are born or after embryonic development is complete. So just turning them on would be completely wasteful and may also um, harm the organism. Some genes also need to be expressed in all cells at all times. And so, sorry, my voice is just like jumping over my words. Um, these are often referred to as housekeeping genes and so some of them are actually really important and they will be constantly expressed, but some of them don't need to be expressed all the time. Okay, what's an operon? So an operon is a segment of DNA containing a group of genes that are transcribed together, so it doesn't exist in eukaryotes. Really keep this in mind, operons only exist in prokaryotes, okay? So it's a bunch of genes that are transcribed together. They separate from the promoter where the RNA polymerase binds. So an operon consists of a series of structural genes which are transcribed together, only in prokaryotes. And so one method of um, gene expression regulation is a trip operon, and this is explicitly defined in your study design. 
There also used to be something called the Lac Operon, so I'd recommend looking that up as well. Um, Lac Operon and Trip Operon, but now your study design is going to be testing the Trip Operon, and so we'll look at that soon. So there is a genus of bacteria, including E. coli, and this encodes for the production of the particular protein tryptophan, also known as TRIP. When too much tryptophan is present, we have tryptophan binding to a repressor. What happens is that this tryptophan molecule binds to the repressor and activates it. And once it's in this activated conformation, it can then bind to the operator region of a gene. And this will prevent transcription from occurring and prevents RNA polymerase from binding to the promoter region. So, um, when you've got too much tryptophan, it's kind of like a defense mechanism kind of thing. It's going to kick in and be like, look, too much tryptophan, let's activate the repressor. So it activates the repressor, repressor binds, and it prevents transcription. When there is little or no tryptophan, this means that tryptophan doesn't bind to the repressor and it causes the repressor to actually change in conformation. The repressor will then detach from the operator region and this allows transcription to occur, as RNA polymerase can then bind to the promoter of the operon. The repressor is coded for by a regulatory gene, TRIP-R, and this sits upstream, so just like way out separate from the operon. And so it's way upstream of the tryptophan producing gene on the operon. So the repressor is also a protein or an enzyme. Um, it's encoded by a, a gene because it is a protein and it's just like separate to the entire operon. Okay, diagram. So this line here, it took me a really long time to know this or learn this, but that means it's like way away. Like it's not right next to it, it's actually like quite a long way away. So here is your operon. <clears throat> Trip E, D, C, B, and A are all structural genes. And then you've got a few regulatory genes. And you've got the promoter region where the polymerase wants to bind and the operator region where the repressor will bind. And here you've got Trip L, which is known as the leader sequence. And we'll look at that soon. Trip R is way upstream. It encodes for the trip repressor. And so what happens is that that will be transcribed into mRNA. That mRNA will be translated into an actual protein, and so what that protein is, is actually the trip repressor. And so here it is in its inactivated state. When you've got a high amount of tryptophan, it will bind to the repressor and activate the repressor. Um, after this, like when the repressor is activated, it's actually going to bind to the op uh, operator region. And so in binding to the operator region, it causes a physical blockade there. And this actually prevents the RNA polymerase from being able to bind to the promoter region. As a result of this, the RNA polymerase can't actually go through and transcribe these structural genes. So you have kind of the entire operon just like being shut off, like these genes are going to be downregulated because the polymerase can't actually bind the promoter region and can't actually go through and transcribe these genes. <clears throat> okay, is it still recording? Oh my gosh, I thought it stopped recording for a minute. We are fine. Okay, so that was the first method of kind of like regulating the trip operon. So you actually have um, the repressor being activated. When the repressor is activated, it will bind to the operator region and prevent the polymerase from going through and transcribing these genes. We have a few methods of, a few more methods of regulating the trip operon. So one of them is known as attenuation. And so, like, although repressors prevent transcription from starting, Attenuation actually prevents transcription from completing, and so a region called the leader codes for an attenuated sequence, and the attenuated sequence forms hairpin structures. So within the leader are two tryptophan codons. This means that in order to translate the leader, we need tryptophan. This is kind of a complex process, so I'll try and work through it slowly. I mentioned we've got the trip L here, which is the leader sequence, and inside the leader we've actually got an attenuator. So this attenuator forms a hairpin loop. So I might just open up a browser here and explain what I mean by that. Um, uh, oh, shout to practice. Hairpin loop. So RNA we know is single-stranded, unlike DNA, which is double-stranded. What happens is that RNA can actually form loops in on itself. So you can see here that it's, while it's a single strand of structure, it's forming complementary base pairing with its own strand, right? And so it's forming lots of loops. And so um, as a result of this, you have the formation of hairpin loops. 
what happens is that the trip owl sequence, which is the leader sequence, it will actually be transcribed into mRNA. Consequently, this mRNA will then actually go through and will um, form some hairpin loops. And there are two types of hairpin loops. Something else to note is that within the leader, there are two tryptophan codons, and these codons encode for tryptophan protein. So in order to translate the leader, we need tryptophan. And so depending on the level of tryptophan we have, we will have different hairpin loops forming. <clears throat> Are we going for time? We're fine. So in the case of low tryptophan levels, the ribosome... Uh, okay. I need to like pause here. I didn't learn this until uni. Like this wasn't part of my study design. I saw something called the lacquer one, which was much more simplistic. I found I had a lot of trouble learning this because it just like took me... I, I don't think anyone really simplified this enough for me. But I didn't realize that in prokaryotes, Transcription and translation can occur at the same time. So I show my students like a diagram. So you can see here, you've got the DNA. In prokaryotes, there's no nucleus. As a result, um, Transcription and translation can occur together because there's no like segregation of these two processes because the nucleus means the ribosomes can't get in and like the, the uh, mRNA is going to leave the, the nucleus first in order to be translated in eukaryotes, right? But in prokaryotes, there's no such thing as a nucleus. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, so because in prokaryotes, um, the DNA and the, because, ah, in prokaryotes, because the DNA isn't sequestered in the nucleus, you can actually have ribosomes going through and translating that mRNA straight away. So what you do is you have RNA polymerase reading the DNA and making mRNA. So this purple thing here is the mRNA strand. And pretty much as soon as it starts reading it, a ribosome is going to jump on and start translating that, okay? So pretty much... Transcription and translation are occurring simultaneously because there is no sequestering of the mRNA in the nucleus because there is no nucleus. So it's really important to understand that transcription and translation occur at the same time in prokaryotes. Okay, so what happens is that um, you have that later sequence being transcribed and it will form some kind of a hairpin loop and if you've got enough Tryptophan, you could translate the later. What happens there is in low tryptophan levels, the ribosome will move through the later really slowly as we need tryptophan for translation. As such, a hairpin loop is created that does not stop transcription, so transcription occurs. In high tryptophan levels, the ribosome will move through the later very quickly as we have lots of tryptophan to translate the sequence. A hairpin structure is created that does not stop transcription, therefore transcription doesn't occur. Um, so it does stop transcription, so therefore transcription doesn't occur. And as such, the ribosome pulls up the mRNA, and RNA polymerase detaches from the operon. This is all really complex. The way that I think of it is, if you've got low amounts of tryptophan, when the ribosomes go through it, they've got to translate it slowly, because they're looking for tryptophan. They've got to go through and search for that excess, extra tryptophan, right? So it's kind of a slower process. So what happens is, um, they go through and they read the mRNA slowly. And they read it very slowly. So they're quite calm and relaxed. The way I think of the other process though is in high tryptophan levels you can quickly translate, you zoom through it and it kind of creates a formation of a hairpin loop which in my head I like to think of it as like it zooms through super fast, it causes the ribosome to like fall off. It just goes through, it zooms so fast it falls off and it kind of disturbs the RNA polymerase and so this causes the RNA polymerase to also detach. So this will, will stop transcription and transcription will stop occurring. Um, I don't know if that makes a lot of sense, so I'll just try and say it again. In tr low to defend levels, I like to imagine that it, the hairpin loop, you know, it's quite a slow, cruisy process. The ribosome go through and translate it slowly. This doesn't disturb the RNA polymerase at all because it's going through and translating it very slowly, very carefully. In cases of high to defend levels, the ribosome will zoom through that loop and translate it very fast, and as a result, you're actually going to have the ribosome falling off. And I just kind of think of it's called like an earthquake and it causes the RNA polymerase to also fall off. Therefore, transcription will be halted as well.
Um, it is quite a complex process. And what I really recommend doing is looking up the Vika Bio FAQ document. So if you look up this document, it really discusses what you need to know about um, this tricky concept that is called oh, TV, sorry. Um, why did I not download? Okay, to download. Um, this tryptophan or tripoperon. I think the tripoperon is probably the most complex process we'll discuss. Um, that and CRISPR, I think. This one might be a bit harder, I think. So definitely go through and look at this VKI FAQ document because it really explains what you need to know about the tripoperon. Um, you can see that diagram is literally taken from this document here. It explains what you need to know about it. And it kind of goes through lots of really difficult areas of study or like topics that you need to know. And so making sure you read this and understanding what goes on is really important. <clears throat> so do recognize that tryptophan um, or the tryptophan in prokaryotes has a transcription and translation are carrying together at the same time. And it's really important that these processes kind of work together. And so if the polymerase, sorry, if the um, Ribosome falls off, this can actually alter the polymerase, the polymerase may also fall off too. Whereas if the ribosome goes through and translate it very slowly, then that polymerase can go through and transcribe it slowly and it won't fall off. <coughs> cool, so just kind of emphasizing here that attenuation is possible because transcription and translation occur at the same place in the cytosol. And this isn't possible in eukaryotes because they don't occur in the same place because you actually got the presence of a nucleus, meaning that transcription must occur in the nucleus and translation occurs in the cytosol or the RAPU path. So as RNA polymerase moves to the operon, the ribosome can begin translating the mRNA even though the full strand isn't completed yet. <coughs> okay, moving on from the chip operon. If you've got any more chip operon questions, just put them in the chat. Um, I think we're going pretty good for time. Now we're gonna be moving on to energy transformations or cellular respiration. I just uh, did the PA lecture recently, so I also do PA as I mentioned. And if you actually do PA, you'll notice that quite a lot of these topics will kind of work with one another. So, um, or you have an entire area of study that's dedicated to different energy systems. And it's kind of like a closer look at uh, cellular respiration or, or a different angle at looking at cellular respiration. It's kind of cool seeing how the subjects kind of work with one another. Anyway. Energy transformations. So you've got a few different um, processes here. Let me make sure. Uh, give me a second, guys. Okay, cool, cool. <clears throat> so you've got photosynthetic autotrophs. Auto means like kind of own trough is like energy making. So photosynthetic autotrophs are autotrophs which make their own energy using photosynthesis or light synthesizing energy. Um, sort of, so they use their own organic compound materials, so they make their own organic compound materials from inorganic materials and they use light as the energy source in order to do so. You've also got chemosynthetic autotrophs, so they synthesize their own organic compounds from inorganic materials using energy derived from chemical processes. And then you've got heterotrophs, and these kind of rely on intake and digestion of organic molecules from an external source. And so we are heterotrophs, we eat food from elsewhere and we take energy from that. Um, so yeah, if you're doing one two bio, you might look at these these process here is what we're going to be kind of looking at here for cellular respiration. <clears throat> so what is cellular respiration? So while photosynthesis is the process by which complex organic compounds are made from simple inorganic compounds, um, how do we use them for energy? We actually use it via cellular respiration. So cellular respiration is the process in which we break down these molecules and turn them into a usable form of energy. <clears throat> so we take in foods, the carbohydrates, fats, particularly proteins and things, and we undergo this process known as cellular respiration use a few different energy systems in order to create ATP, which is the energy currency of our body. And so this allows us to metabolize and function as human beings. <clears throat> okay, this is quite an intense area of study, so... Please go back through these slides later on, like take the time to try and work through it at your own pace because it is pretty intensive and we are kind of zooming through a bunch of content today just because there is like 
a lot. I just kind of wanted to give you guys like a bit of an intro to these areas of study. Okay, let me have some water first. <clears throat> I might just like reach out some more. <clears throat> okay, hopefully you guys can still see me. I'm sorry, I'm still recovering from being sick. It's very annoying. Okay, so cellular respiration is a metabolic process whereby ATP is formed in cells from ADP and inorganic phosphate. And it uses glucose as a fuel. Okay, so ATP is a molecule that contains usable chemical energy in the form of a high energy bond, which can then drive reactions within cells. And they've got this dramatic, sorry, dramatic statement: without ATP, we would die. So, <clears throat> um, this kind of blew my mind when I realized it. But ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, and that adenosine in the ATP is the same adenosine in our nucleotides in DNA. Isn't that cool? And like obviously, like DNA contains phosphate molecules as well. So, kind of just like shuffling about a few of these can create different things. So you've either got DNA or you've got energy. I just think that's so cool. So that ATP is used to to give us chemical, or give us energy, and it's like a an energy currency in our cells. <coughs> so ATP um, is a one adenosine molecule with three phosphate and in chemistry, like bonds contain lots of energy typically for a lot of the time. So snapping a phosphate molecule off the ATP to create ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate, the two phosphates, this releases some energy which we can use and um, it can facilitate muscular sorry, can facilitate muscular contractions and allow us to go about our daily lives. Once we've actually snapped off this bond, we can actually rebuild it and make ATP once again from that ADP. So we'll end up with adenosine triphosphate once again. And then once again, we've got that high energy bond there. So snapping it, release energy of ADP and inorganic phosphate, and then rebuild it. So we go through this entire recycling process, and it's really useful at allowing us to make energy. Okay. I see this kind of post around on my feed a lot, and it's like, what's the most important thing you remember from school? And people go, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. I want you to know right now that this is rubbish and don't ever say this again, please. Because what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. I don't I couldn't tell you what that means. And Vikai couldn't either. If you put that on your exam, you're going to get no marks for that. So please don't write that down. What you should say though is that cellular respiration, or the mitochondria, actually you just say the mitochondria is a site of aerobic cellular respiration. Okay? That's what I want you to say. Not powerhouse of the cell. So, <clears throat> we've got a few pathways here. What is my mobile to go slow? We've got two pathways for cellular respiration, either aerobic or anaerobic. And so aerobic, I just think air, sounds like air, like we breathe in air. This is respiration which requires oxygen and it produces lots of ATP. It occurs in the mitochondria and it occurs quite a lot slower than other pathways. The other pathway, anaerobic respiration, this doesn't use oxygen and it also produces ATP, but it produces a lot less ATP. However, it is a bit faster, but it produces like such a tiny amount of ATP. It occurs in the cytosol of the cell and once again, no oxygen. This little prefix an, um, it means no, so no air or no oxygen respiration, okay? So anaerobic respiration is also referred to as fermentation. So this is the metabolic pathway that's followed in the absence of oxygen or the absence of mitochondria, which is in red blood cells. So you might know that red blood cells don't actually contain mitochondria. They don't contain a lot of anything, really. They're just kind of um, like buses for oxygen. Like they just kind of shuttle oxygen about the body and get them to the working muscles. And so anaerobic respiration occurs in um, the cytosol of the cell. <coughs> I think I've got a nice. Yep, I think it's good. Oops. <coughs> What happens is that you have glucose, which is a six carbon molecule. Um, you need to memorize glucose, like it's chemical formula. So it's C6H12O6. So make sure you're on top of that. Um, so this glucose, which is a six carbon molecule, it is broken down to two pyruvate, and, which is a three carbon molecule. So you have three, sorry, two, three carbon molecules being produced as well as NADH. And you've also got two ATP being produced. So essentially the stage is glycolysis and then the cell processing the products. Um, 
In animals, you've actually got the production of two lactate molecules from these pyruvates and NAD plus also being produced. In yeast, you've got two ethanol being produced as well as two carbon dioxide and NAD plus. We don't produce ethanol. Ethanol is alcohol. We don't produce that. Yeast do. So imagine if you like started running and you were undergoing like anaerobic respiration and instead of producing lactate or lactic acid in your muscles, you started producing ethanol. It, would you get drunk at that? Is that what would happen? I'm not really sure, but we don't have to worry about that anyway because we don't produce ethanol because we are not yeast. This is kind of like an intense looking diagram, but what it's showing you is the mitochondria and you've got glucose here being um, consumed and you've got the production of NADH and FADH2. To be honest, I think this diagram is a bit strange to look at, so if you prefer this one, like I prefer this one, use this one instead. So note that they are that there are coenzymes or electron carriers NADH and FADH2, and these are really important later on. The first stage of both the aerobic and anaerobic pathway of respiration um, involves one molecule of glucose, which is CCH1206, being broken into two molecules of pyruvate, which are three carbon molecules each. This occurs in the cytosol of the cell. You need to know your cellular locations, you need to know what's being produced, um, and you need to know how much ATP is being produced at each stage. This stage does not require oxygen, it is anaerobic, and it produces a net of 2 ATP. <clears throat> so here you've got glucose being converted into two pyruvate molecules. You've got NAD being converted to NADH, so NADH is an output, NAD is an input. ADP and inorganic phosphates are inputs, and then you've got ATP as an output. This is a structure, sorry, structure. This is a picture of a mitochondria. Um, what is the mitochondria? It's a site of aerobic respiration, as I mentioned before. It's not the powerhouse of the cell, it's a site of aerobic cellular respiration. And so it's a site of the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, which are the two stages of respiration. So there are two membranes in the mitochondria. The inner membrane is super highly folded and convoluted. Um, so you can see it's got all these folds. Christy, and then within the Christy, you've got the mitochondrial matrix. The mitochondria also contain DNA. I think it's kind of cool looking at the history of the mitochondria. We think it might have been some kind of a very small prokaryote, which was kind of like engulfed by a bigger molecule um, or organism, and it kind of became embedded. So this like prokaryote became an organelle, which I think is quite cool. Um, so it's like an endosymbiotic theory. The mitochondria need tons. Uh, so it produces tons of ATP, and so cells which need lots of ATP, like muscles, have lots of mitochondria. So muscle cells need lots of ATP because they need to produce lots of energy to facilitate these muscular contractions, and so they're going to have lots of mitochondria. Red blood cells have no mitochondria. What does that mean? Well, it means they don't produce a lot of energy. Red blood cells are not there to make energy. They're there to shuttle oxygen around the cell, which kind of makes sense because we don't really need to make energy in the red blood cells, but we do in the muscle cells. So what a mitochondria looks like under the microscope. I think this is an electron microscope. Um, it's got an electron microscope. It looks really cool. You can see the little highly folded structure in it. Just like one more time. I recently moved um, to med school and I feel like the air here is dry. Like I'm always a little more thirsty than usual. This is a weird observation, but anyway. <clears throat> okay, so you have the respiration. So we already had the first stage, which is glycolysis. Glycolysis pretty much means glyco, glucose, lysis, breakdown. So breakdown of glucose into two pyruvate molecules, which we know. Next up, instead of going and producing lactate here, we've got the pyruvate, because here we're going undergoing, so here we are undergoing aerobic cellular respiration. We have those pyruvate molecules being converted to acetyl-CoA, which are two carbon molecules, and one carbon dioxide. The loss of electrons actually reduces NAD plus to NADH, and this is known as the pre-step or the intermediate step. So pyruvate is converted to acetyl-CoA, which is a three carbon molecule. So you have NAD plus being converted to NADH, uh, CoA being converted into acetyl-CoA, along with that pyruvate. You've also got the production of carbon dioxide as a byproduct. Um, so the second stage is this acetyl-CoA will actually enter the Krebs cycle in the mitochondrial matrix, and with each turn of the cycle, 
One acyl CoA will give rise to two carbon dioxide molecules, one ATP, three NADH, and one FADH2, so two times per glucose. Uh, it's kind of a con convoluted process. Once again, I recommend going through it and trying to work through each stage in your own time. Don't worry about that because you don't need to know that. Um, but that's just kind of like looking at how intense respiration is. And if you do biomed, you'll probably spend an entire semester at least like looking at this. It's kind of an intense, <sighs> intense topic. Um, biomed flashbacks. But yeah. Hopefully this makes you grateful that you're just doing this. Um, so each pyramid molecule is converted to acetyl-CoA. You've got the loss of electrons reducing NAD plus to NADH. Acetyl-CoA enters the Krebs cycle in the mitochondrial matrix in which turn one acetyl-CoA gives rise to two carbon dioxide molecules, one ATP, the NADH, and one FADH2. So it's obviously, it's not a lot of ATP right now. Um, but anyway. <coughs> We had two pyruvate molecules at the start, we produced two acetyl-CoA's, and so the cycle actually happens twice, and so this per glucose, per one glucose, you have two pyruvate being produced, and specifically two acetyl-CoA, you've got NAD plus being produced, FAD, two ADP, and inorganic phosphate being produced, and this all occurs in the matrix of the mitochondria, okay, so this is the Krebs cycle. Also known as the citric acid cycle. So with each cycle, we get um, 2 ATP, 6 NADH, 2 FADH2, and 4 carbon dioxide, okay? So these are our outputs, and these are our inputs. I know it's a really complex process, and it kind of, okay, it kind of sucks to have to go through it, because it's a lot to, like, store in your brain, but really working through this entire process and seeing how much you can memorize is a really good way of learning this. So trying to draw out the process, trying to remember your inputs and outputs is really effective. <clears throat> okay, now we're into this next stage, which is the electron transport chain. So in the CRIS stage, so this follows the mitochondria, we have these protein complexes, and they actually have the ability to receive and donate electrons via carrier molecules. So electrons are passed between these complexes like a chain, and so the movement of electrons does work. It literally causes spin energy, and it kind of causes a bunch of protein complexes to actively pump hydrogen and ions into the intermembrane space. And what this does is it creates a proton gradient, or potential energy. So that was a lot that I just like told you. But hydrogen ions are also known as protons. Um, H plus ions, hydrogen ions, protons, these are all the same thing, synonymous words. So what happens is that you will pass a bunch of electrons along these protein complexes and cause them to create a proton gradient, or potential energy. The hydrogen ions will then move down the concentration gradient into the ATP synthase enzyme, and this causes the ATP synthase enzyme to synthesize ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate, thus producing 32 to 34 ATP molecules. Oxygen acts as the final electron acceptor and is converted to water. <clears throat> so you can see here how you've got the cristae, so a series of um, protein complexes within the folds of the mitochondria, uh, you've got a bunch of uh, proton gradients being um, created. Sorry, my mind just dipped for a second. You've got proton gradients being created. And what this eventually does is, you know, passing these electrons and stuff along the, the complexes causes this particular enzyme to spin around. This enzyme, enzyme is called ATP synthase. And so it actually is like a spinning rotor, and it produces a ton of ATP to be produced. Like, I know I just said spinning rotor, and it's like, yeah, whatever, but... If you look up actual um, like diagrams of this this protein or this enzyme complex, it actually literally spins like a rotor. It's really cool. Um, so I said that my second year, and I was just like blown away that you've got these tiny little machines in your body. So just think how small a single cell is, and then think how small a tiny mitochondria in that cell is, and then in the mitochondria you've got little folds, and in those teensy little folds you've got these tiny little protein complexes and enzymes, and one of those enzymes is literally a spinning rotor. I think that's so cool. Like it's so, so tiny. And it's making all this energy that allows you to function. I think it's cool. Anyway, um, if you're interested in that, look it up on the internet. ATP synthase. I think it's super cool. And it produces all the energy we need. So you see that electron being um, shuffled about along these uh, energy carrying molecules. And it causes the, the turning of this ATP synthase. <coughs> So 
to ETC times the electron transport chain. It's really easy to get confused with how much we need to know about this process, but essentially we've got electron carrier molecules giving up electrons at hydrogen at the crystal of the mitochondria. The electrons are accepted by and pass along a series of electron acceptors on the crystal. We've got the interaction between electrons and protein complexes facilitating the production of ATP, and then oxygen will then capture the electrons, which then combines with hydrogen to form water. Okay? Um, oh, another thing to note here is that when looking at your cellular respiration formula, you have the production of water. This electron transport chain is a stage at which this water is produced. So you don't actually have water being produced anywhere else. Okay, so when oxygen captures the electrons, this will then combine with hydrogen and it will form water. Okay, so keep that in mind. <coughs> Also for um, the Krebs cycle, we know that the Krebs cycle is an aerobic process, but it doesn't actually utilize that oxygen, okay? So the oxygen that we require in aerobic respiration is only utilized in the final stage, electron transport chain. But you can't go through the Krebs cycle unless you have sufficient oxygen, okay? Otherwise you just go through the anaerobic respiration in the cytosol of the cell. So make sure you understand that. Um, here's just a summary. So, inputs by glucose, you've got NADH, FADH2, ADP, and PI, and that oxygen. And then your outputs by glucose are NAD+, FAD, and 32 to 34 ADPs, or six hydrogen, sorry, six water molecules. And this occurs in the crystal of the mitochondria. You've got lots of ATP energy being produced. Um, I just want to make sure I've got the right amount of ATP. Okay, so it should be 26 to 28. Oh, this is the overall formula. Um, oh yeah, that should be fine. 26, 28. And there should be about 32. So I might just say 32 here. I will edit that on your actual slides. Um, <clears throat> you really want to keep in mind that this document here has everything you need to know about changes to the study design. So in 2022, there was a new study design created, and so this one has the updated content that you need to know. So for glycolysis, you've got two ATP being produced, and for Krebs cycle, we've got two ATP being produced as well. And then for the electron transport chain, you've got either 26 or 28 ATP being produced. So ultimately, you've got 30 to 30 of two ATP being produced. Um, yeah, so keep that in mind. And go back and check this document if you're unsure. So for our overall equation, the word equation is glucose plus oxygen produces carbon dioxide or water, and our chemical equation is 6O2 plus C6H12O6, um, it's been converted, it's supposed to be an arrow, uh, to 6 carbon dioxide and 6 water, and our total ADP yield is about 32 ATP. Um, so kind of like this diagram, but overall your aerobic respiration will actually produce 32 ATP. Um, so yeah, be really aware of that, make sure you go through and like check it. I might actually revise this slide, um, but yeah, be really careful of that. But different textbooks will say different things as well, so you really want to ensure that you're using the VCA study guide, like the actual VCA study guide, so make sure you know that. Go back to this document if it's still there. <clears throat> so, pretty much summing up, um, cellular respiration is a process in which glucose is broken down to form ATP energy, and there are two types of cellular respiration. Either aerobic respiration or anaerobic respiration. So be really careful about that. And it produces ultimately about 32, 30 to 32 ATP. <clears throat> so glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm or the cytosol of the cell, whereas the Krebs cycle occurs in the mitochondrial matrix, and then you've got the electron transport chain actually occurring in those folds of the mitochondria known as the cristae, so the mitochondrial membrane. Anaerobic respiration occurs in the cytoplasm, so for animals you've got glucose being converted to lactic acid and to ATP, and for plants and yeast you've got glucose being converted to carbon dioxide and ethanol and to ATP. Uh, just important to note here, plants also undergo aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration, so I think it's easy to forget, because because they undergo um, so, sorry, photosynthesis, you think they don't undergo respiration as well, but they do, so kind of make sure to keep that in mind. <coughs> So here you've got um, respiration, kind of just differentiating between aerobic and anaerobic. With aerobic, you've got oxygen being required, it also occurs in the mitochondria. You've got water and carbon dioxide being produced, and more ATP also being produced. 
With anaerobic, no oxygen is required, carcinous cells of the cell, um, lactic acid is produced in animals and in plants or yeast, you've got ethanol and carbon dioxide being produced, and also less ATP. Okay, moving on to photosynthesis. I'm also just going to check how many slides I have left. Oh, wow. We've got like, you know, we've still got like 30 slides left. And I'll definitely spend a lot of time discussing how I studied for the exam um, and stacks and things. And so, yeah, it should be helpful. And I should tie this over for some time. Okay, so we're about halfway through now, which is pretty good, I reckon. Am I still on frame? Okay, photosynthesis. I'm not really sure what this is just showing. I guess it's just kind of emphasizing that ATP is our energy currency of the cell and it's really important and we need to make a lot of it. And plants make glucose, which we use to produce ATP. I thought this was really funny. You hungry? Can you use a light snack? Okay, so what is photosynthesis? This is the process in which light energy is transformed into chemical energy. And so this is a really big part of the study design, so you do need to know it in quite a bit of detail. Um, here you've got thylakoids. So thylakoids are where the light dependent stage of photosynthesis occur. And then around it you've got stroma. So stroma is the fluids filled space, and this is where the light independent stage occurs. So you've got two stages of photosynthesis, the light dependent and light independent stages. And they're kind of separated um, depending on where they actually occur. <coughs> So what is a chloroplast? A chloroplast is an organelle which is the site of photosynthesis. It's got two membranes, so it's a double membrane bound organelle. And within the chloroplast you've got grana. Grana are stacks of thylakoid discs. And so you've got the site of light dependent stage occurring here. We've also got stroma. So stroma is the fluid filled space around the thylakoid stacks. Um, it's a site of light independent stage. So you see the, the chloroplast here, we've got two membranes, we've got the stack of thylakoids, we've also got stroma, and um, yeah. <clears throat> so thylakoids within their membranes contain the photosynthetic pigments known as chlorophyll. And these are the photosynthetic pigments which absorb light in photosynthesis. The various types of chlorophyll, um, such as chlorophyll A and B, you don't need to worry too much about them, but these different types of chlorophyll absorb different wavelengths of light. Um, you need to know too much about this here. You can see that you've got a high amount of light absorption occurring at like blue light and high amount of like red light, but not a lot of green light. This is because the plant actually reflects the green light and doesn't actually absorb it. And that's why they appear green, because they're reflected the light. <clears throat> okay, so there's a really important enzyme involved in the light, oh, sorry, in, in photosynthesis in the carbon cycle, which is a stage of photosynthesis, so its role is to fix up the carbon molecule from carbon dioxide into an organic molecule that the plant uses for energy storage. <coughs> so during the carbon cycle, Rubisco fixates carbon to become the organic molecule G3P, which is a three carbon molecule, or half of a glucose molecule. So two G3P all together combine to make a singular glucose. And during this fixation process, carbon dioxide will actually react with this five carbon molecule called RuBP to make a six carbon molecule that splits into two G3Ps. Kind of a complex process. Once again, this document is a lifesaver. Um, I haven't actually taught photosynthesis this year yet, but every year. It's kind of like, an, it's just so intense. Um, and I'm just going to check for Rubisco. Oops, Rubisco enzyme. So this kind of summarizes what we need to do about Rubisco. So we need to know that it's got a, a key role in the carbon cycle in photosynthesis, and we need to go explain how plants have adapted to maximize this efficiency of photosynthesis. So in both carbon dioxide and oxygen can bind to Rubisco's active site, but at low temperatures, carbon dioxide is more likely to bind to oxygen than bind to Rubisco. So um, really understanding that Rubisco is kind of a temperamental enzyme. I actually remember looking it up last year with my students, and the website described it as kind of being kind of a a poor enzyme, like it doesn't do that well. 
like what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to bind carbon dioxide, but it can actually bind um, uh, oxygen instead. So <clears throat> then this is called photorespiration. So photorespiration is not useful. We don't want photorespiration to occur, but Rubisco is kind of just a poor quality enzyme that apparently can bind oxygen instead, and this is not useful. Um, so yeah, definitely going back to this <clears throat> document here and trying to revise it, understand what's going on with Rubisco. Um, yeah, that's really important. I think I've just kind of summarized quite a bit here. So you can see here, you don't need to know too much about all of these stages, but do understand that you've got carbon fixation occurring and you've got the production of two G3P molecules, also known as GA3P. And so GA3P or G3P produces high thick glucose molecule. Putting two together creates one whole glucose. Okay? And you've also got some ATP being cons consumed in this reaction. Um, I don't think we have enough time to really like explore this in any more detail, just knowing that there's a light independent reaction, also known as the Calvin cycle. And yeah, you've got Rubisco enzyme having a key role, making half a glucose molecule, known as a G3P, GA3P. This kind of just summarizes the inputs and outputs of photosynthesis. So water, ADP, and inorganic phosphate, as well as NADP are inputs, and an output of light dependent stage are, um, are oxygen, NADPH, ATP. This occurs in the grana. Um, the second stage is the light independent stage, and you've got carbon dioxide, ATP, and NADPH as inputs. Outputs are glucose, ADP, and PI, NADP+, and this occurs in the stroma. And then you just get a summary of the formula once again. And make sure you do know this formula completely. Like, memorize it, which I know is annoying to have to, like, memorize stuff. But it is very important, so make sure you're on top of it. So most plants will actually undergo photosynthesis by the pathway that we just looked at. These are C3 plants. So there are different types of plants. Under typical conditions, photosynthesis works pretty well. However, in C3 plants, it can sometimes be inefficient. So as I mentioned before, Rubisco can actually undergo something called photorespiration. And so instead of fixing carbon as it should, it might accidentally fix oxygen instead. And so this is kind of wasteful. It leads to photorespiration and it wastes energy and uses up carbon molecules making photosynthesis really quite inefficient. So as I mentioned before, Rubisco is kind of like, it's not an amazing enzyme, like it gets the job done, but like, there's lots of room for improvement. So photorespiration occurs when carbon dioxide levels are quite low, okay? So you're, if you're a plant and you're in a low carbon dioxide environment, you might actually undergo photorespiration and start fixating oxygen instead of carbon dioxide, and this will waste your energy. Um, We've got a few different types of um, problems, I guess, that we need to overcome. So different types of plants, so not C3 plants, C4 plants, or rather, such as corn. These are usually found in hotter areas. And in order to minimize water loss, C4 plants often have their stomata closed. And so stomata are like little holes, pores on the side of the plant. If it's in a really hot area, plants such as corn will close their stomata. While this is good at preventing water loss, it can actually be quite detrimental to the plant because it can lower the amount of carbon dioxide entering the plant. As such, you may actually have photorespiration occurring, which is that fixation of oxygen. Not good. So we have to get around this somehow. And so plants have actually kind of evolved to get around this. And so what C4 plants do is that they separate the light dependent and independent stages into different cells within the plant. So you've got two types of cells, mesophyll cells and bundle shoot cells, which are kind of involved in this process. And so in a mesophyll cell, Carbon dioxide is fixed into a molecule called malate, okay? So, carbon dioxide is fixed into a molecule known as malate. This malate will then be transported to a bundle sheet cell where it will release carbon dioxide and that will then be fixated by Rubisco. <clears throat> so just kind of to emphasize this, um, if you're in a hot area, you might actually lose water, so you shut your stomata, but this can prevent um, carbon dioxide from getting in, right? So you might actually have photorespiration likely to occur. And so in order to get around this, you can separate um, your two stages of photosynthesis, light independent and light dependent stages. So, sorry, in a mesophyll cell, carbon dioxide is fixed into a molecule known as malate, and then that malate will be transported to another cell, a secondary cell, called a bundle sheath cell, where it will release carbon dioxide, which is fixated by Rubisco. 
This means that even when it's hot, C4 plants can have their stomata, sorry, close their stomata and still have a supply of carbon dioxide for Rubisco, preventing photorespiration from occurring. So you can see here the separation of photosynthesis into its two stages into two separate cells can be quite a useful process to kind of circumvent that loss of carbon dioxide that you get from shutting your stomata. <coughs> Cow plants function in a similar way to C4 plants and are adapted mainly to dry environments. Instead of separating locations, cam plants separate the light independent and dependent locations or reactions over time. Not locations, sorry. So in C4 plants, corn and other starchy plants, they separate those two stages via actual physical locations. With cam plants though, you actually separate them over time. And so you open your stomata at night when it's cooler and more humid, and this allows the carbon dioxide to actually enter the plant. That carbon dioxide will then be converted into malate, which is then stored in the plant until the daytime. During the daytime, your stomata might close and you might not be getting enough carbon dioxide, but that's okay because you've already got the malate there. And that malate will then release that carbon dioxide. And this allows Rubisco to fixate it during the carbon cycle. Okay? So keep in mind, cam plants have um, separation of the light dependent and independent stages of photosynthesis temporarily. Te temporarily. Um, I think it's the right word, temporarily, or over time, whereas the other one is like a location-based differentiation. So cam plants can actually close their stomata during the day. It's still a supply of carbon dioxide for rubisco, preventing photorespiration from occurring. So they open their stomata up at night, let the carbon dioxide in, um, store that carbon dioxide as like malate, and then that malate will be open up later on during the day once the stomata is closed, which is the stomata is closed during the day. We still have sufficient amounts of malate, allowing photosynthesis to occur as opposed to photorespiration. Okay. Um, cool. If you've got any questions, just like pop them in the chat. I know it's kind of an intense area of study. There's kind of a lot going on. So, let's put them in the chat and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Okay, now we're into um, DNA manipulation, which is a really cool um, area of study. I'm sure I'm still in frame. Cool, we've been going, we're over halfway now, guys. I know it's kind of a lot of content, especially you might be on like break right now. Um, so well done for watching this. But yeah, I'm trying to break it down and make it digestible. Hopefully I'm not like, like I'm not flat right now. Usually I'm super peppy about this. I'm just still recovering. Okay, this is one of my favorite areas of study though. I think we've only got like 20 slides left anyways. And then we'll go into like revising for exams and how to study for exams and things. <coughs> okay, so DNA manipulation. So this is quite a big area of study. I think it's one of the most exciting ones. There are lots of like new advances in technology and DNA manipulation technologies every week it feels, and I just think this is a huge potential for future technology and innovations. So, firstly, endonucleases. What are endonucleases? Endonucleases are actual particular enzymes generated by bacteria. You can kind of tell they're enzymes because they've got this suffix at the end, ase, endonuclease. So these are enzymes generated by bacteria which cut through DNA specific nucleotide sequences. They're also known as restriction enzymes. These are kind of used synonymously, so endonucleases are pretty much the same as restriction enzyme. These enzymes are produced by bacteria to protect themselves from bacteriophages, which are viruses which infect bacteria. Molecular biologists can use these enzymes to manipulate DNA for many different purposes, such as genetic cloning. So how would endonucleases protect bacteria against viruses? Um, hopefully I get a good description of that in the next slide. So, um, I think I mentioned bacteriophage. Did I mention bacteriophage? Yeah, I did. So bacteriophages are virus which viruses which specifically affect bacteria only. So you don't usually get attacked by bacteriophages, they only affect bacteria. So a bacteriophage will land on a bacteria. We know that viruses have RNA or DNA inside of their like protein capsid head. And what it will do is it will inject the genetic material into a bacterial cell. Viruses are considered like inert or kind of like dead sort of outside of the body so once they land here they inject the material into the cell and they start actually assembling viral proteins and so that viral genome will enter the bacterial cell um, consequently you actually have 
um, that genetic material being transcribed and translated into actually the production of viral proteins. Um, that will then like leave that bacterial cell and go off and infect more bacteria cells. So, it's not good, not fun. <clears throat> you can see that the bacterial genome in this picture is blue and the viral genome is green. So what happens is that that viral genome injects itself into the cell, it infects the bacteria, hijacks its mechanisms, hijacks its ribosomes, and makes viral proteins, and it kind of just disturbs the body, the bacterial body, right? But bacteria have a special kind of defense mechanism. So bacteria are single-celled, remember? They are prokaryotes, they're unicellular organisms. They, um, <coughs> uh, sorry, they are single-celled organisms. They only have one cell, um, what was I going to say? Oh, okay, sorry, I remember now. Um, they don't have advanced, like, immune systems like us. So we've got really advanced immune systems. We're going to be talking about antibodies and things later on in the year, um, and we'll get to that. It's a really exciting area of study. But right now we're just looking at bacterial immune systems, and they don't really have a whole immune system per se. But what they do have is some molecular scissors present. And so what happens is that that uh, viral genome will get into the cell and bacteria will get sick and suffer. But what they will do is they'll actually take a copy of this viral genome and they actually store it in their own genome to remember it later on. And so the next time this bacteriophage comes back and reinfects the bacterial cell, the bacteria goes, hey, I remember you. I took a copy of you a while ago. Let me like go check my nucleus. Sorry, not my nucleus, my, um, what you call it, like a nuclear, but let me go check my genetic material and see if I've got a copy of you. And they go, yeah, you're familiar. And so what they do is they recognize that invader, that invading virus. And they actually kind of release a bunch of endonucleases. And these endonucleases are pretty much molecular scissors which go off and cut up that viral genome. And so bacteria, the first time it gets sick, it suffers. It gets infected again and it remembers this virus. And so it actually releases its endonucleases and goes off and cuts up that viral genome. And this will actually render it like dysfunctional, like it can't actually go and, you know, be transcribed and translated and make viral proteins. And so it's kind of like a really rudimentary immune system in the bacteria. So it prevents the bacteria from actually um, getting sick a second time, hopefully. <clears throat> so restriction enzymes, as I mentioned, or endonucleases are molecular scissors, pretty much, and they cut DNA at certain recognition sequences that are specific to that particular enzyme by breaking covalent bonds between nucleotides. And so these restriction sites, so recognition sites are known as restriction sites, and they're usually palindromic. So you can see G-A-A-T-T-C, G-A-A-T-T-C. Um, so palindromic means the same forwards and backwards. The same forwards, backwards. <clears throat> My favorite palindrome is race car. So if you spell that race car, it's the same forwards and backwards, which I think is really cool. Okay, so, Endonucleases or restriction enzymes can actually cut up DNA, and there are two different ways they can cut it up, either in a sticky end where it leaves these little overhangs. So you see these overhangs here, or it can be a blunt end, which is just like straight up and down. So it's really important you recognize this, <laughs> recognize it because recognition sequences. Um, yep. <clears throat> You don't have to memorize any of these at all, um, just kind of knowing that there are many different restriction sites conducted by different enzymes. The most common one you get in VC is probably E. coli, G-A-A-T-T-C, but you don't need to memorize that. So what happens is that E. coli will cut and it will leave a sticky end. Um, you can see you've actually got that overhang, so that's the sticky end, whereas the blunt end is what just goes straight up and down. Kind 3 is another endonuclease restriction enzyme and it also causes a sticky end. So DNA ligases join together segments of DNA by catalyzing the formation of the phosphodiester bond between nucleotides. And so these are bonds which hold the DNA backbone together. So if you think of DNA as like a double-stranded segment of um, nucleotides, it's kind of like the rungs of a ladder, right? You've got the, the backbone of the ladder two backbones, and then you've got the rungs here, and these rungs have hydrogen bonds there, and then the, the phosphodiester backbone along the back, um, that, that's the phosphodiester backbone. What does the ligase do? The ligase catalyzes the formation of that phosphodiester backbone, all those bonds, and so ligase is kind of like molecular glue, and so it's very important if you want to manipulate DNA. 
So as I mentioned before, we've got um, endonucleases or restriction enzymes, those are the molecular scissors, and then you've got molecular glue, and the molecular glue glues that backbone together. Just sitting up a bit. Can you see on frame? Yeah. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, we've got polymerase. So polymerase, so RNA polymerase is really important in transcription processes. You've also got DNA polymerase, and this is an enzyme that's responsible for forming new DNA strands by joining nucleotides, which are essential for DNA replication, but also PCR. So CRISPR-Cas9 is a DNA manipulation tool that involves directly editing genes within an organism. CRISPR-Cas9 is an enzyme found in bacteria that functions somewhat like an immune system. And so we'll look at this later on in Unit 4. So CRISPR-Cas9 works in bacteria by recognising viral DNA and cleaving it, therefore protecting the bacterium from the virus, and scientists have actually used this mechanism to edit genomes by making CRISPR-Cas9 cleave DNA at a specific location. Okay, good. I have got a diagram here. I'm just going to spend some time going through this diagram because it's kind of a complex process. I'm just going to drink first. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, in bacteria, um, we don't have immune systems. And so when a bacteriophage virus infects the bacteria, what it will do is that it will inject its genetic material into the poor bacteria. That genetic material is going to be transcribed and translated, and it's going to make viral proteins, which will then escape the bacteria and release it into the environment. Um, so the bacteria will get sick, poor bacteria. However, um, when that bacteriophage infects that same bacteria once again, what you have is um, the bacteria recognizing that, that virus, right? And so it actually goes, hey, I've seen you before. And that releases its endonucleases to cut up the invading viral bacteria. So viral DNA or RNA, and it will kind of render that genetic material immobile and useless. And so it can't actually cause um, the hijacking of all the cellular mechanisms of that bacteria and making viral proteins because it's been chopped up. So... This is due to the bacteria actually keeping a copy of that viral DNA the first time. Okay, so it gets sick the first time and it goes, okay, I'm going to get sick, that sucks. But I'll actually remember it. So when the viral um, DNA enters the cell for the first time, a sequence of the DNA, known as a spacer, is actually incorporated into the bacterial genome. So the first time that DNA from that bacteria virus infects the bacteria, it's actually... Um, going to be saved in the, the bacterial genome. The bacteria is going to be like, okay, I'm going to get sick now. That sucks. But I'm going to remember you for next time. And so it makes sure to take a sequence of DNA, known as a spacer, and save it in its own genome. And it's saved within a particular region called the CRISPR array. Okay? So the bacteria will save the spacer within the CRISPR array for the next time. If the same viral DNA enters the cell at another time, the bacterium will recognize the DNA due to the space that matches it. So that virus is going to infect the bacteria again. The bacteria is going to be like, wait a minute, I know you. Because it actually has that space to sequence already incorporated into the CRISPR array. This DNA spacer will then be transcribed. So it's in the DNA of the bacteria. It will then be transcribed. So you've got a complementary sequence. And they'll be transcribed to RNA. Something called guide RNA. <clears throat> that guide RNA will actually join something called the Cas9 enzyme. So the Cas9 enzyme is actually an endonuclease and it's a type of molecular scissor. So this guide RNA joins the molecular scissor and it's like a recognition site. It will recognize its particular invading viral genome DNA and it's found the molecular scissors. And so it finds that site of the DNA where it recognizes, so that one that the initial um, spacer came from the virus will recognize it because it will be complementary so it will bind to it. You can have the Cas9 chopping it up. Eventually this will cause the corresponding section of viral DNA to be cleaved, effectively destroying the viral DNA and preventing infection. Okay? So I think I might go through that process again. This is super thirsty. What happens is that CRISPR-Cas9 is a type of like viral defense system that bacteria have. Bacteriophage will infect bacteria. 
we will insert DNA or RNA into it, it will make the bacteria sick and the bacteria will get sick, which is sad for the bacteria, but it will actually remember that virus. And so it actually saves a copy of the viral DNA into something called the CRISPR array. So we'll save a sequence of viral DNA called spacer and save it within the CRISPR array, okay? When it gets infected by that bacteriophage, once again in the future, it's actually going to transcribe that spacer sequence to make a complementary strand known as the guide RNA. This guide RNA will be complementary, and so it will actually bind to the bacteriophage's viral um, genome, the invading genome, and recognize it. And because this guide RNA is actually attached to the Cas9 complex, or the Cas9 enzyme, it will actually chop it up and cleave it. And this will effectively destroy the viral DNA and prevent infection. <clears throat> this is really cool for bacteria. It means they've got kind of a rudimentary immune system. But it's even cooler for us because we've actually kind of stolen this genome technology and kind of exploited it in the lab, sort of. Um, so what happens is that we actually use this system in order to edit genes. And so in bacteria, the guide RNA matches the viral DNA to be cleaved. How we can, we can actually create a guide RNA for whatever sequence we want. So we can actually get a piece of DNA, examine it, and actually create our own guide RNA, which would be complementary to it. So for example, if there is a hereditary disease, such as Huntington's disease or sickle cell anemia or something like that, we can actually examine the viral, uh, sorry, the um, genome and particularly the, the sequence, which actually leads to this disease, and we can actually create a guide RNA which is complementary to this particular gene of interest. As such, we can actually create a CRISPR-Cas9 complex, so we'll have that guide RNA, which is complementary to it, and we can attach it to the Cas9 um, molecular scissors or endonuclease, and it will cut the gene at that particular region. As such, we can actually cut up or cut out that particular sequence which causes the disease. We can actually try and solve like quite deadly or detrimental diseases here. So pretty much the options are quite endless. We can cut out a gene and inactivate it, but what we can also do is use other technologies to add a gene, modify a gene, delete more of a gene, and more. So it's actually a really useful process. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we call this CRISPR-Cas9. So you can see here we've got uh, a double strand of DNA. So this is the target DNA. We'll have this guide RNA here, which is actually targeting, so the guide RNA here, is targeting this particular sequence here. And you have the Cas9 sequence, which actually causes that cleavage process. So it snips up that DNA and causes an incision, which you can then insert another gene into or delete this region or modify it, etc. So there's kind of a lot that you can do here. Um, <clears throat> just checking time. So we discussed endonucleases a few slides ago and how they know not to cleave DNA belonging to the bacterium. So I don't know if I did that or not, um, but I'll let you know now. Bacterial DNA is methylated, whereas foreign DNA isn't. So if we go back a few slides. Here you've got the bacterial genome, and you've got the invading viral DNA or RNA. And so the endonucleases are going to cut up this invading DNA because we'll actually scan it. And so bacterial DNA is methylated, meaning it's got little CH3 groups, kind of like little flags saying, hey, don't kill me. Whereas the viral DNA or RNA doesn't have this. And so the endonuclease will be like, hey, look, no methylated flags. Let's just go off and kill it, okay? So it kind of checks it first. It scans it first with these little methyl groups. And if no methyl groups, then it will cut it up. So as mentioned here, bacterial DNA is methylated, whereas foreign DNA isn't. So endonucleases only cut DNA that they are supposed to. So the CRISPR-Cas9 system has a really similar safeguard, and it's something called the PAM sequence, and this stands for protospacer adjacent motif. This is how the Cas9 endonuclease or restriction enzyme knows to cleave viral DNA, but not the spacer in a CRISPR array. So um, when you create your CRISPR-Cas9 in the lab, or like in a bacteria, you actually have the guide RNA being saved within the actual bacterial genome, right? It's saved within the CRISPR array. What happens though is when you actually get the sequence of interest and save it as a crisp as a sorry um a spacer sequence in the CRISPR array, you always make sure to take a segment of DNA which is next to something called the PAM, protospacer adjacent motif. So I'll just repeat that. When the bacteria is kind of saving a spacer in the CRISPR array, it always saves a sequence of DNA right next to something called the PAM, which is the protospacer adjacent motif. 
So it saves that and it puts it into the bacterial genome in a special region called the CRISPR array. Okay? Um, yeah, so it saves it in the CRISPR array. It always makes sure to take it from the PAM sequence. Cas9 will only cleave DNA that is followed by a PAM sequence. So when you actually insert it, that, that um, spacer sequence into your CRISPR array, you just don't bring the PAM sequence with you. So you snip it out and save it. When you are cutting up with the endonuclease Cas9, it's going to scan through a genome, and if it's next, if that particular sequence it recognizes is right next to a PAM sequence, then it will cut it up, okay? So it must be followed by a PAM sequence, and it's usually just a short sequence of a few nucleotides, which you can recognize. Um, so the DNA sequences, sorry, the DNA spaces within the CRISPR array are not followed by a PAM sequence, so Cas9 doesn't cleave this DNA, right? It has to be followed by a PAM. Therefore, when we're in the lab and we're actually designing our own guide RNA, scientists first have to make sure that there is a PAM sequence next to the gene that they are targeting. Okay, so you can you can actually like design sequences which will like be complementary or, or bound. So you can actually specifically design guide RNAs, but you need to make sure there's a PAM sequence there. But there are just tons of different PAM sequences, and so you can actually pretty much tailor um, where you want to cut the DNA. Okay, so you can see here you've got the target DNA, you've got the CRISPR array or that guide RNA, it will recognize its gene of interest next to a PAM sequence, and so it will cut it with the Cas9, which is that endonuclease enzyme. This cutting it causes a double-stranded break, which is initiated by the Cas9, and you can have an insertion of a gene, or correction of a gene, or deletion of a gene. <coughs> CRISPR-Cas9 is a fairly new discovery. It's been around for a few years now, um, but it's super useful. It's actually been really involved in many different genome technology processes, which I'll probably discuss. Um, it's a fairly new discovery. It's applications in genome editing are still being studied, and like there are lots of ethical laws relating to CRISPR-Cas9 and kind of regulating its use, particularly in humans, but even in like genome technologies relating to like agricultural needs and farming. And so it is quite contentious at the moment, and there are lots of like ethical concerns about it. So some concerns which are being studied are if a gene is inserted, what happens when it's done its job and is no longer required? Just look at time. Um, what if Cas9 cleaves at unwanted locations? Will it work in the long term? Um, for example, people with chronic diseases will constantly need the gene to be working. What if a gene has unknown influence on a certain characteristic or function and is inactivated? What if the mutations caused by crystal Cas9 lead to cancer? The main issue is really potentially off-target effects. Why is that the end of the slideshow? Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm just going to discuss this kind of casually for like 10, 15 minutes first, and then we'll just go into kind of discussions about how I study for the exam. So, yeah, there's quite a lot of going, a lot of content just about CRISPR-Cas9. I haven't put any articles here, but this is something you'll have to research in your own time. And it's not something you have to research, but I think it's a really good thing to go back and like learn more about it so I would recommend just going into the news like The Age or um, my favorite magazines The Atlantic and they've got lots of different scientific discovery articles so what happens is that we can look in these articles for CRISPR specifically and just read up on like the ethical discussions. So the problems associated with CRISPR. If a gene is inserted what happens when it's done its job is no longer required. So if you insert a gene um, what happens if that gene is no longer needed? Like before we were talking about embryonic development and some genes are only required in embryonic development. And once you finish embryonic development, they're down-regulated or switched off. What if you insert a gene, right, and that gene is not actually needed in the long term? So if you insert this gene and it's it's kept within this, this individual in the long term, what happens when you no longer need it? Is it just going to keep producing these proteins you no longer need? Is it going to waste energy and resources producing these proteins? It can actually have adverse effects affecting this individual in the long run. It can be quite dangerous. What if Cas9 accidentally cleaves at unwanted locations? We know that naturally our body does make mistakes, right? So if we are inserting this Cas9 gene, I'm sorry, Cas9, just the Cas9 uh, complex, so that guide RNA and the Cas9 endonuclease into an unwanted location, what happens if it accidentally cuts elsewhere, right? Or what if it accidentally goes to the wrong spot and cuts something which is actually quite vital? What happens then? And so, I mean, you may argue that if we can cut up stuff, we can, like, fix it, but it, it, it may go unnoticed for quite a long time, right? And it can cause quite a lot of detrimental, adverse effects as a result of that. 
Will it work in the long term? So for example, people with chronic diseases will constantly need the gene to be working. So some people have particular diseases whereby a gene is switched off. What if we use CRISPR to turn it on? What if the gene then gets shut off by another protein or enzyme or something like that? So we really need to make sure that these genes continue to function effectively for the duration. So not just a short period of time, but for kind of a long period of time, particularly long term if someone has a chronic disease. What if a gene has unknown influence on a certain characteristic or function and is inactivated? So you may not know that a gene, like you might feel like this gene is useless or it's causing problems, so let's turn it off. But what happens if this gene is actually kind of useful? Or what if we don't know everything this gene does? So it's really important to recognize that genes um, may have many different functions which we don't actually know much about. Like we're still, we only fully categorized or like, yeah, I think it's like categorized the entire human genome a few years ago, like two years ago, I think. Um, so I remember being, I think it was in second year, and one of my professors made an announcement like, oh my god, we've fully, like, sequenced the entire genome. So we've sequenced it, but we don't know what every single gene does. And there are lots of genes where we think they have no function, or we just think, you know, we've completely categorized its entire functionality. But what if we're wrong? What if there are more functions? And what if switching off this gene can actually lead to adverse effects? Or what if turning on a gene can actually lead to more adverse effects? There are many off-stream or off-target effects which we perhaps are unaware of right now. Another really big common fear mongering technique, I guess, is what if the mutations caused by CRISPR-Cas9 can lead to cancer? So what if you accidentally switch on a gene and this causes the creation of a tumor or something? So it's quite dangerous um, thinking, I guess. I also want to talk a bit more about ethical considerations. So you can use CRISPR-Cas9 for quite a wide myriad of different um, uses, so most prominently in agriculture and farming. And so you can actually specifically target particular genes. And so the agricultural and farming industry uses CRISPR-Cas9 quite prominently now. So for instance, you can have tomatoes, right? And tomatoes are like fruit in a particular season. Um, and so what you can do is you can actually use CRISPR-Cas9 to modify the genome of a tomato plant and actually make it so that it flowers all throughout the year as opposed to it's just one like season of fruiting. And so this means you've got tomato plant flowering all year. And so this can be really useful to farmers who actually rely on tomatoes, right? They can actually like have more tomato fruits all year, which might be really useful. However, how does this affect like the wider ecosystem? So Tomato plants may be supposed to flower only one particular season of the year because then other plants are able to flower throughout the rest of the year. And so without this, you may actually be disturbing the natural ecosystem of the plants. And this might seem like, like kind of a small scale problem, like, okay, so what? But there might be particular bugs or insects which actually rely on other plants to survive. Or perhaps some bugs rely only on tomatoes. And so as a result, they're actually flourishing. And also lead to an imbalance of these particular bugs which rely on tomatoes and hence disturb the ecosystems because then you'll have you know, maybe the pests which rely on these bugs, things such as birds or rabbits or something, maybe, actually rabbits don't eat bugs, birds or something like that, they will um, then flourish. Or for instance, rabbits. Rabbits may be relying on these tomatoes now and they'll actually have an increased you know, surplus of rabbits and as a result, you know, foxes will be well fed. And then it kind of has off-stream effects on the larger ecosystem, you can see. Um, other things you can use CRISPR-Cas9 for include making things pest resistant. So um, some plants are particularly susceptible to locusts or may be really susceptible to disease. And so you can actually make them resistant to disease or pests. And so as a result, they won't die from diseases. But diseases are a method of natural selection. So diseases will wipe out particular plants or individuals who are considered not strong enough to withstand them. As a result, only those who survive have genes which confer like strength and make them um, immune to like particular diseases, right? And so this allows us to undergo mutations or wipe out members of the population who are considered not strong enough to withstand these things. If we are modifying tomato plants or potato plants or whatever to make them withstand diseases, we're kind of messing with the natural selection of things. And many people don't like this idea of kind of playing God. They think it's unnatural and it's disturbing the natural environment and it can be disturbing the ecosystems in quite a big way. Um, some other big uh, concerns relating to CRISPR-Cas9 and other genome modifying technologies include um, organicness of materials. So there was a big lawsuit a few years ago whereby a farmer who was like an organic farmer he was saying his fruits were all organic. However, someone next door to him was using genome technologies to kind of alter their plants. And so this actually kind of spread into this organic farmer's seeds. 
And so as a result, he was starting to produce plants which were no longer organic anymore because they were actually modified via genome technology such as CRISPR. And so this is also a problem. It's kind of messing with the ethics of other people. It can spread. Um, and a really big problem relating to this is that related to pesticides. So farmers can actually make their plants or en genetically engineer their plants so that they are resistant to pesticides. What this means is that, you know, I can engineer a tomato plant to make it resistant to pesticide. As such, I can spray an entire field with pesticide and the tomato plants are all going to survive. They're not going to die. So all the weeds are going to die because they don't have the pesticide resistant genes. But what happens if these pesticide resistant genes actually spread into the weeds themselves? As a result, you'll actually have weeds which are resistant to pesticides. You kind of have to keep leveling up the amount of pesticide use in order to kill off those weeds. Moreover, pesticide use isn't a good thing anyway. Like, it can be quite detrimental to our health as human beings. And so we do want to avoid using them. And so just, like, spraying an entire field without abandon just to kill off the weeds and using lots of pesticides can cause detrimental problems for us. So we will eat these plants and we might get sick as well. So this is kind of another severe problem. So I've kind of discussed quite a few problems. I might just discuss a few like good things about CRISPR and then we'll discuss studying for the exam and doing well in bio overall, which I think is probably what a lot of you guys are here for. Um, but yeah, first, uh, benefits of CRISPR. So, um, yeah, we have talked about like quite a lot of negative stuff about CRISPR, a little bit about like playing God or pesticides and things. Um, so I might just quickly talk about one more. Um, no, I think it's fine. Okay, we'll talk about positives. So a few years ago, um, I think in parts of Asia, quite a lot of um, kids or students were, were going blind. Like their vision wasn't very strong. Um, like their vision was deteriorating quite quickly and at quite a young age. And so this was due to a deficiency in vitamin A or vitamin A in their diet. Or actually a precursor of vitamin A in their diet. And so scientists and you know, health boards wanted to solve this problem. And so what they did is they actually engineered rice. So rice is a stable food in these environments. And they actually genetically engineered rice to actually express a vitamin A precursor gene. And so this meant the rice would actually go like yellow. It would be like a golden color. So it's called golden rice. And so this yellow rice was then distributed across these areas. And because it's a stable food, people would eat it more often, right? Or eat it pretty often. But because it's actually been enriched with this vitamin A precursor, it actually enabled these kids to produce more vitamin A. And as a result, their eyes was starting to deteriorate less. And it actually improved the vision of like entire communities in this area and actually prevented the blindness from occurring at such a young age. So you can see this is like a big success story of CRISPR. It's actually prevented quite a lot of blindness in lots of young people. So you can see it's actually done quite a lot of good. Um, you can also like make vegetables like fruitier, like bigger fruits or more juicy vegetables or tastier, stuff like that. Enrich them in vitamins. So um, this can also be really good at like preventing sicknesses and disease by enrichment. And it can be quite like a cheap and relatively easy process to do. Um, but you also have to be like really aware of the fact that large companies and corporations may actually have a monopoly on these um, plants. So a lot of companies will actually genetically engineer plants so that you can't take the seeds and plant them and grow your own plant. And so they pretty much hold the patent or the rights to the entire plant. And they can like hike up the prices of these plants to farmers and make the farmers pay more. And farmers obviously depend on these seeds for their livelihoods. And so... You see, there's kind of like a large power imbalance being created here. So it's really important to keep that in mind too. Um, other benefits of CRISPR. I mean, you can look at everything I've just discussed previously on like the other point of view. So, you know, making them more pest resistant. Like if we just kind of put aside the fact that you're spraying pesticides, you know, it can be quite useful to create pest resistant plants because then they don't die from locusts and things. Um, so yeah, looking at like both sides, being able to discuss both sides is really important. And I would highly recommend... Just every few weeks going back and looking up benefits of CRISPR, pros and cons, stuff like that. Cool, okay. Um, that was most of what I had to discuss about CRISPR, I think. 